Good afternoon, everyone. Hope you're all doing well. Welcome, 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 welcome. I have my new handy dandy uh, microphone uh, because I heard that last week I had terrible sound and I've had this microphone for a while. So hopefully we will have good sound for the entire day. Um, welcome. While you're all waiting for people to come in, please um, please choose your language. If you speak English, go down to the bottom, choose interpretation and choose English. And in a moment, as more people come in, I will have our interpreter Lorna say that in Spanish. In the meantime, it is in the chat. Open up the chat, Connie Lapin. Um, you are all uh, muted upon entry. We do this intentionally because we do not um, want a lot of background noise when the interpreter is working. And we also want to prevent Zoom bombers, which I am pretty sure was trying to happen at our self-determination meeting at Westside yesterday. And we were able to kick that person out before any damage was done. So I don't, I'm not completely sure if that was happening, but it was pretty unbelievable. Um, all right, so go ahead when you have a moment, Lorna, and please explain in Spanish that people should um, pick a language. Thank you so much. So for those of you who entered after I said this, you are hearing it in Spanish, you must pick a language. And you do that by going down to the bottom, choosing English as your language. Um, and we will get started. So thanks, everybody. For those of you who've never joined us at SB, SDP Connect, we are Usually um, every other week, but up until the self-determination program takes off, we are doing it every week, um, takes off uh, statewide. We're doing this every week and then probably over the summer, we'll go back to every other week. Um, we have been doing these at STB Connects for probably nine or 10 months now. And we have a library of all of those um, STP Connects in our interchange. So if you go, and I believe that it's already been put in, um, yes, it already is there, and so on top of it, um, that if you go to our self-determination interchange, you'll find tons of information about the self-determination program, but you'll also find the library of everything that we have done so far. Um, we've done probably 30 of these, maybe more. Um, we'll probably start start them over again. I think the first week we talked about unmet need and then we just kind of really went through the program in, in incredible detail. Um, one of the things that we will do as well, besides having a specific subject that we're gonna talk about is will we take the first half hour to hour, depending on how long the presentation is and we answer your questions, any questions you might have. and. You know, usually I'm the one answering them, but I don't want to always be the one answering them. Honestly, there's a lot of amazing experts. So here's the way we're going to run the meeting today. I'm just going to give a very brief update on where the budget is and what's happening. Um, and then we will open it up. And the way that you will be able to ask questions or make comments is by going down to the bottom of your screen, clicking on, and some people have it as raise hand, I have it as reactions, and then raise hand, and you'll see this raise hand thing up there, okay? And you can put it down at any time as well. Um, and what you were, um, and I will call on you in order. You can also put your questions in the chat. Uh, Ed monitors them, and at a certain point, just goes through them and, and asks on your behalf if you don't wanna speak. 
In addition, um, for those of you who, who know a lot or or you don't even, if, if you have something that you want to add, like let's say somebody asks a question about a particular regional center or a particular issue um, and you have a follow-up question or you have a, um, you have a, an additional question about that or if you have an answer would be awesome. What you can do is just, you can pro either private message me or just put something in the chat saying, I have a comment on that so that we continue that conversation, okay? Um, so I, I have to say that last week in particular, um, a lot of you were private messaging me long questions that you wanted me to answer. Please try not to do that because the chat is moving so quickly that I cannot catch that. In fact, now that I think about it, you shouldn't private message me if you want to speak. You should private message Ed because uh, you know I try to actually listen to what you're saying and I can't read the chat at the same time that I'm listening to you. So it would be great. I changed my mind. Ed Herzl, who is the host of this meeting, if you could private message her and tell her that you want to comment on something. But mostly what you should be doing is raising your hand. And I see Sean Costello already has his hand raised, but we haven't started that process yet. But I promise I will call on you first when we're getting to those questions. Um, all right. So um, be, uh, all right. So let me give you some updates on where things are. So we have one more week of budget hell. And then really by the 15th of June, the budget will be set. But it never ends here in California. So let me give you a few. I can't even remember where things were a week ago, honestly. So I might be repeating things or not even giving you the latest updates. So, um, so when we last left off, um, there was trailer bill language that the that the governor has created. Trailer bill language is the sort of language that explains how money should be spent. And there's $10.2 million in the budget for the self-determination program. The vast majority of which, 80, like 80% 80 of it is going to regional centers to hire staff. And, you know, we're as an organization, DBU is a little concerned that that's a lot of staff, 60 new people around the state. And that we wanna make sure that they're being held accountable and that they're not putting up like additional barriers for participation, but they're actually getting people in. Um, and that they're actually, you know, really doing their job. So, um, so we have added, and we've, we've suggested that there be things like timelines that people need to be, you know, they need, the regional center needs to get back to them in a certain amount of time. And that um, there's certain clear directives to the regional centers. So um, we're not sure we're gonna win on that, but we will continue our advocacy around it. In addition, um, there is two and a half million dollars, but we can spend more if we need to, to allow people moving into the program to access funding to provide person center planning services as you enter the program. So remember that you cannot spend, um, that when you hire an independent facilitator, once you go into the program, that has to come out of your budget, but you don't have a budget yet before you go in the program. So. BDS has, has created this way that you can ask for services through your regional center for person center planning. If you need to know what they're called, zero, the, the rate code 024, if you need to act, you know, say that to your service coordinator who may not know, you do not have to use a vendor service provider. You can use anyone who has had some background in person center planning. In some cases, that individual does need to fill out some vendor paperwork. They should be very, it should be a very small amount of paperwork, like getting their, you know, W-9 form, you know, for taxes and stuff like that. It should be pretty basic. Do not let your regional center tell you that you have to use their vendor provider. That is, I'm hearing that at a couple of regional centers that they're going saying, we want to move into the program. We want to hire a person center planner. And they're saying, oh, here's the agency you have to use. That is the opposite of self-determination. So you do not have to use their provider. Um, there are tons of people doing this. 
Some of them are quite excellent. Some of them are quite inexperienced. So it is up to you to interview them. If you go to our website or if you bought our wonderful book called uh, Think Outside the Box, you will uh, see in it, if any of you have it in front of you, um, you will see in it on page 158 that we've written, um, I wrote them all, but uh, they're used in the orientation, the official orientation you have. Um, we've written some sample questions for you to ask prospective independent facilitators. Things like, hold on, hold on, I passed it. Things like, how much do you know about the self-determination program? What experience have you had? Ha have you had any training? Have you ever facilitated a person-centered plan? How many have you done? You might wanna ask them to show you a copy of a plan that they've written, You know, obviously taking out the name of the person that they did it for or any identifiable information. So um, you wanna use these questions because you just don't wanna pick the first person that you find. There are no lists of independent facilitators that you should be working off of. That doesn't mean that there are no lists. Some regional centers have collected a list. Some state council offices have collected a list. I'm completely opposed to lists because if you have a list, then it is totally the opposite of self-determination. Anyway, I digressed for a moment because I thought that was really important because now is the time to, um, to start making your plans if you're not yet in the program to make your plans to find a person center planner. Um, so, um, so, okay. Um, so next is, um, I, I'm seeing that, that Carla is asking uh, the link of the questions. I think it's the questions to hire an, a, an independent facilitator. So it's actually part of our book but it's also in, it's part of the, D, uh, the DDS orientation. So if you go to the DDS website at dds.ca.gov and you look up self-determination and the training information, you'll see a whole section on selecting service providers of which a, an independent facilitator is a service provider. So, um, so you should definitely uh, look that up because that's all, all for free. You can get that information. All right, so that's part of it. And then there's gonna be additional funding in the budget to uh, create statewide training programs on the self-determination program um, for both regional center staff and to create a consistent orientation. So, um, so that's sort of the update on that piece of the budget. There's so many other pieces of the budget though that impact the self-determination program. One of them is the restoration of social and recreational programs. Um, right now, the legislature, both the assembly and the Senate have, a have said that we should restore social rec, which is so great. Social rec used to exist before 2009. It was taken away. We, they've been we've been promised it would come back for years. We think this might be our year. We actually have a campaign that um, if you scroll up in the chat, you'll see that Ed's already put it there, that we have a campaign to call the governor and tell him that, that he should restore social rec. Um, I really should have started this discussion by saying that the state of California is rolling in the dough. We have so much money right now, which is really kind of shocking considering the year that we've just had, but, you know, most of the tax revenue that California receives is from rich people and rich people and rich people and upper income people, they did really well during the pandemic. Oh yeah, they did super well. Hold on, my, my this happened last week. This is a very bad thing that my, my gardener comes every week at this time and he's right outside my door. So let me close my window. Okay, so my window is closed. You will not hear the leaf blower right outside my window. Um, so um, it is, uh, so, so one of the things that, you, that, that is really critical is if we can get the social rec restored, that'll actually increase everyone's budget um, because you will be able to go back and ask for those services 
And then you'll be able to, to use that increase for hopefully spending money on social rec. You don't have to spend it on social rec, but you could spend it on social rec. Um, there are other pieces of the budget that's really critically important. Um, one of them is that the legislature is calling for about a 1.4 billion with the B like in boy increase in rates for traditional service providers. And as you know, um, the, the, the budgets for the self-determination program are determined by the services that you receive in that you would receive in the traditional system based on those rates, those average rates. And so if those average rates go up, and some of them might go up by a hell of a lot, your budget's going to go up by that same amount. So I'll give you an example. So let's say you're a person, you're an adult, and you receive, um, uh, let's say, 10 hours a week of independent living services. And that rate is currently, let's say, $25 an hour. I, th that is incorrect, but let, I'm just making things up. The rate is $25 an hour, but the legislature and the governor agree to raise the rate to $30 an hour. That $5 an hour for those 10 hours per week is added to your self-determination budget. It's not like people in the traditional system get to benefit from it and we don't. So it's really important for you to be watching what's happening in the state budget. Policy matters. Of course, we spend all of our time on public policy at, at DVU, so we, we care a lot about it. But Policy matters and it's why you need to get involved. And we love that you're all here and that you're all helping us make calls to the governor and email the governor. Really, really important that you get involved in this way because it, it matters to our children and to us. So um, there are some other really significant pieces. The budget has so much money. Our system is gonna be a $10 billion system and potentially higher because of the monies that are coming in from, you know, with potentially these, these rate increases. Um, so um, there's also things called, like uh, if you require a, sta a staff person who speaks a language other than English, uh, you um, in the traditional system, that staff member would make more money per hour um, because they are bilingual, or even if they are, um, if they do know sign language for the deaf community, they will make more money, and that extra money will be added to the to the budget. Um, so there, there's also a training piece where if if direct support professionals, people who provide that actual care with the individual, um, goes through some training programs, they will get an increase of up to three dollars an hour, um, and that. Same three dollars an hour would be added to the self determination budget, so it's kind of exciting all the things that are happening and all this new money, and all of the details on it are going to be worked out in by the fifteenth of the month. So that's like in six days we will know. So at next week's SDP Connect, I will be able to give you a lot more information on. So that's the state budget. So now there's an additional almost $1 billion that's gonna to come to the state from the federal government through what's called the American Rescue Plan Act or ARPA. The American Rescue Plan is giving extra money uh, one time because of COVID to say, we're gonna help states get out of the problems that they've had with COVID where, you know, obviously people with developmental disabilities were much sicker and died at higher rates. We also are gonna, coming out of it, are gonna have a lot of mental health struggles. And uh, last week, uh, the Department of Developmental Services released how they wanna spend the ARPA funds, the funds from the federal government. And there's some pretty spectacular things in there. I can't even remember if I went over this last week, if it had even been released. I'm looking at Nina. Do you remember if I went over this last week? Hold on, I'll mute, I'll mute you. I don't remember when it came out. I don't think so. I, think I don't think it ha I had, okay. Oh, well then God, I have a whole lot to tell you. Let me get it up on the screen. Oh, and I'm really, okay, I'm gonna, I'll do a screen share. Let me try to do a hide sidebar. Okay, there we go. 
All right, I'll do a little screen share for you. So we'll go over it. There's some super exciting things in here, guys, um, that are, um, that I can tell you at Disability Voices United, we have been asking for some of these things for years. But the first thing I wanna talk about is the name. So it's, so first of all, this, this almost billion dollars is, no, I'm sorry, it's, it's over $5 billion for all of what's called the home and community-based services that are spent in California. And that's not just people with developmental disabilities. That also includes seniors and people with mental health disabilities and veterans. All of these people get these HCBS funds. So what you're gonna, and homeless people too. So you're gonna see that this is a very large plan that is all of the services that we care about and IHSS. I am just gonna go over the things that are related to our community. The, the ironic thing is that they are calling it a spending plan, just like the spending plans that we have in the self-determination program. And the thing that's like super funny about it to me is that when I was, um, I participated in a number of meetings with DDS about it last week. And I said, well, I'm not sure you're asking for enough money for this. Can this be changed? And the DDS director said, oh, of course. I mean, this is just a spending plan. Things can change at any time. And we just need, you know, we just need to like basically tell the, um, uh, the feds that this is what we're going to do, which I found to be quite hilarious because we've been having so many problems getting regional centers to just move forward with the spending plans that we submit to them. And they are micromanaging us and here, the, the, we're talking about billions of dollars and the spending plan is going to just, you know, oh, it's just a spending plan. So anyway, I plan on, by the way, I plan on using that little analogy as we're moving forward. But so, so what I'm going to show you right now is just a, a proposed spending plan that is not going to go through the same budget process that I talked about. The legislature actually doesn't have to approve it the legislature can say, we like this, we don't like this, but this is totally Governor Newsom and the Secretary of Health and Human Services, Galley, and Nancy Bargeman, the director of DDS. They are asking us for our opinion about this. Actually, they already asked. It's too late for you to tell them. <laughs> they, they, they told us about the plan on Thursday and Thursday afternoon, and the deadline to give them our comments in writing was Saturday at noon. And I can tell you that we worked really hard at DVU to express our opinions about these pieces. So let me just go through some of the highlights to you. You can find this document on the DDS website. I'll try to find it. Actually, um, Nina, would you mind running into the DDS website and see, if, or maybe you have the link from something I've sent out somewhere to and put it in the chat. Thank okay. you so much. Sure. Um, so, by the way, this is Nina Spiegelman, our policy person, our legislative person at DVU. Um, okay, so um, I'm just getting to, okay, so the way, so you're going to see that there are five different areas. There's the workforce, so they're looking at retaining and building a network of a workforce. Um, there is uh, HCBS navigation. Oh, I will Sanford sending me a message, Will, who knows a lot about policy, saying they have to get approval to spend this money. That is that is true when it's, so yes, let me explain. How they're gonna spend this money absolutely requires legislative approval in detail. They're gonna be doing what's called more trailer bill language over the course of the summer on exactly how they're spending this money. So the let, but right now, this proposal that you're seeing that's gonna be spent to the feds, set, not spent, sent to the feds, that does not require uh, legislative approval. This is gonna go to the, fed, to the federal government saying this is how we wanna spend it. All the details are gonna get worked out through a process with the legislature over the summer. So the second piece of it is, um, HCBS navigation, you'll see transitions, uh, services, and infrastructure support. So we'll, we'll explain that. I'm just going to go to the sections that are relevant to our community. So um, 
IHSS, this is a big deal. So IHSS is going to be getting some increases in funding. Um, and that includes, you'll see this in bold, that IHSS providers that complete a state identified pilot specialized training pathway will receive a $3 an hour pay differential. So I know that many of you have IHSS workers or are IHSS workers yourself. It sounds like you will have to go through a special training program. It might be online. And once you show that you have done that, um, you, can, uh, you can get $3 an hour more. There is also going to be, I don't know if it's in this section. There is a section that talks about that every, I think every IHSS worker is getting like a one-time $500 bonus. Um, I can't remember. Here it is, right here. This funding would provide a one-time incentive payment of $500 to each current IHSS provider that provided IHSS to recipients during a minimum of three months between March 2020 and December 2020. So during the pandemic. So that's great. So if any of you are IHSS workers or you have them, you're going to be getting this just out of the blue $500 extra, which is so great. And I know that'll make a huge difference to these IHSS workers who are super lowly paid. Um, I'm just going to keep going through because there's so much in here, but I'm only going to really focus on things that I understand, like there's stuff on homelessness and stuff on Medicare, um, traumatic brain injury. Okay, here's here's this. So this you knows now this is for the employees, the staff who work on um, who work through regional center funded. Uh, programs, which is different than IHSS workers, remember. So these programs, um, for, so for these providers, um, the direct support professionals, so these are the people who work directly with people. So these are not the supervisors and the owners. It's those staff who come into the home um, and uh, to assist with retention, any current direct support professionals will get a $500 bonus. And for new hires, they'll get a $500 si signing offer. So it says, uh, I, so wait, this is the $500 recruitment. Wait, to assist with retention. Oh yeah. Each, each direct support professional, DSP will get $500. And upon hiring folks, it'll get, they'll get new the hires will get $500. I have a feeling it'll be like $500 if you work a certain amount of months. Like it's not going to be like, oh, I got my $500 and I quit tomorrow. I think you may have to work there for maybe three or six months or something like that. Um, uh, then there's going to be training for the direct support professionals who will then get some sort of training bonus when they go through it. Um, so this, by the way, um, we have directly asked whether this in, would mean that um, people in the self-determination program would also be able to get these kinds of bonuses. And so far, the answer is yes. Um, we want to make, in fact, every single thing you'll, you're seeing here related to the traditional system, we want to ensure also goes to people, in, to people who work in the self-determination program. There's also something that I think is really odd and weird that's been added. It's called employee insistence for all DSPs. And I, I would actually love to hear from direct support professionals if they think this is going to be useful. Um, but this is for uh, this, they're gonna create this kind of counseling service for $15 million, which is a hell of a lot of money for people to be able to call up some service and get counseling and support and referral for when it's needed. Um, I'm not really sure how this is all gonna work. So we'll see, we'll see. I, it's, it's a very odd thing. Um, there's gonna be this, they're gonna be hiring tons and tons and tons of community navigators to, um, to help people get services. I just really, really hope that they'll help them and not be more barriers, which often happens. Um, they are gonna, so they're, they're getting lots more of that. All right, now we're going into navigation, which is very weird because navigation is also not up there. So I'm not sure why it's in there twice. 
Um, and in the relationship with DDS, I'll move to the section about our community. Oh, there's nothing in there. Okay, there was nothing in there on ours because it was in the previous section. Um, under transitions, there are a few pieces that relate to the DDH system. I'm just looking, see how it says lead department? I'm just looking for when it says DDS. Um, hold on a moment, here it is. I really should have done my little PowerPoint. I forgot that I, that I made a PowerPoint off of all this, but that's okay. You're actually seeing the official document from the state. So there's $150 million for affordable housing, which is amazing. And so one of the ways they're talking about using it is to develop more affordable high up housing. So what that would mean is that, um, let's say there's a community um, let's say Los Angeles is developing a bunch of uh, affordable rent uh, apartment buildings. They what what DDS would want to do is negotiate with the city of Los Angeles to say, OK, you're developing this project. We want 10 percent to be specifically for people who are regional center clients. Um, and that they would be able to have this affordable housing um, and we will pay you, we will, we will invest in your development of, the, of this housing project to be able to get that, what's called a set aside. There, another piece is huge, which is for those individuals who, um, who require rental assistance, meaning for their health and safety, they can get uh, funding to help pay for their rent through regional centers, and it's a very small amount of people, but they're very often they're folks who need um, health and safety. You know, maybe they have really very specific needs in, in the community because of health, or because maybe some uh, sort of dysregulation challenges, or maybe they're undocumented and they're not eligible for Section Eight housing or SSI. This um, this rental assistance will be expanded and. We very specifically heard from Nancy Bargeman that it would also be included in for people in the self-determination program. So I know I have a friend at a regional center who very specifically said that she could not enter the self-determination program because she gets rental assistance and now she definitely will be able to. So this is kind of huge. All right, now we're talking about capacity and models of care. Um, they're going to expand, um, adult family home agencies. This is it. Um, so if you guys don't know what that is, an FHA is a, an agency where it's kind of like a person owns a home and kind of, a, it's kind of like almost an adult adoption a little bit. They, the person lives there, they feed them all the food, they give them all their, um, they, they help them, they assist them with their daily um, activities of daily living. Um, it is, uh, so they're gonna expand the use of these family home agencies. I only know one person who's ever lived in one and it was not a good experience, but I would be always interested in hearing from all of you if you've heard of good experiences with family home agencies. Um, because if, if you've heard of good experiences, then we will, be very happy about this, but right now I'm a little suspicious. This coordinated family support services is something that uh, we and, and Disability Rights California have been asking for for years. This is so incredibly exciting, this one. So what this says, so right now, if you're an adult, um, you can only access 24 seven supports in your home if you don't live with your family. So let's say you go out and you have supported living services. You can only get access to those services if you live outside the home. But there are many cultures where they would not, they, they do not believe in having their adult children live outside the home. And yet they really have needs. They have needs for care, possibly 24 hours a day. Um, and there are some who are, uh, there are some, remember that rent is only paid is paid for by SSI checks. And in some cases, people can't afford to live. I mean, SSI checks are like eight, nine hundred dollars a month. And there's not a lot of places that in California where that rent, where that pays for your rent. So this now gives 
uh, these community, these individuals, a chance to uh, get that kind of support that they need, even if they continue to live with their family. This is so huge. Obviously has a huge impact on the self-determination program because once this goes into effect, you can ask um, your service coordinator to add this to your budget so that you can um, be able to access these kinds of services. Um, Reimagine work activity programs. So for those of you who've never heard of a work activity program, a work that it's basically a sheltered workshop this is where people, lots and lots of people with developmental disabilities all work in this big kind of warehouse. And they often do kind of mindless work and they get sometimes paid like a dollar an hour, sometimes pennies an hour. It's called the sub-minimum wage. It's something that we as an organization and, and several others have been calling for an end of for many years. Um, so what this would do is provide funding to support people to get out of those work activity programs through person-centered planning and creating a plan for them to be able to have sort of competitive integrated employment, which is a job like people without disabilities have in the community. This is very, very exciting. Um, another exciting um, opportunity is this community integration for children and adolescents. So what this would do is it would it would have um, it would go out into communities around the state and work with the community based social and rec programs like Parks and Rec in your count Parks and Recreation in your county or maybe YMCA's or maybe um, even you know, summer camps um, to be able to say, okay, you're a, you are currently providing this service for your community. What do you need to make sure that you include people with developmental disabilities? And this goes hand in hand with the restoration of social and recreational programs. Because when the, if we win a restoration of those programs, those programs are gonna have to be integrated in the community. They're not, we're not going to go back to 2009 where there's going to be the theater program and the swim program and the gymnastics program that are only people with disabilities in this so segregated site. They're going to be funding programs that are truly in the community. And so we have to figure out how to get those community groups to include our kids. So maybe it's that, that they need to create a changing room just for the person with the disability. Or maybe, you know, because maybe it's an adult who still is in diapers and we have to have a place for them uh, to, to, to be changed because they have physical disabilities. Maybe if they're a swimming pool to ensure that they have a Hoyer lift to send the, to, to be able to make sure that that person with the disability is able to get in and out of that pool safely. Maybe it is a, um, maybe it is training for staff to understand what autism is, to understand how to communicate with people who maybe communicate through typing or spelling. So there's lots of ex exciting activities and these local community groups can get grants from DDS to be able to open up their program to people with developmental disabilities. And then we could use our the, the funding that social rec would be restored to be able to pay for those programs. So it's super exciting. Um, then um, there's uh, their increasing capacity capacity for the deaf community. There was already funding in the original budget for the deaf community, and this is adding even more funding for the deaf community. So this means that we their regional centers will have individuals who who sign um, who who know ASL to be able to sign with. Uh, family members and um, self-advocates who use sign language. It means that we will pay hopefully a differential for staff members who, ha um, who understand sign language, who, who can communicate through ASL. So um, also assessments, lots of other things. So it's very, very exciting that, um, that, that we're seeing such an investment in this where we've been fighting for this or certainly people um, in the deaf community have been fighting for this for many, many years. Um, the final piece, which is massive, relates to infrastructure and support. 
And this is probably the largest amount of money that's coming in to the, that, that's going to be spent. And they're calling it system improvement. And this is something that a lot of us have been saying needs to happen. So, um, so this is really about, some of this is about technology and upgrading the technology of the developmental disability system, which is desperately needed. So um, this, uh, so here's kind of the ways, so it's a total of $256 million being spent on this, but this is how it is broken down. Um, first of all, uh, $45 million to hire more service coordinators. Um, that's in addition to the, addition, the, the money that is being spent in the budget that will be finalized next week. Um, uh, you know, for us, uh, we support this as long as there's accountability at regional centers to say that, that uh, people are actually getting services as opposed to just hiring more service coordinators to create more barriers. Like to expand the bureaucracy is not a goal of ours. The goal of ours is to get people services and to have great outcomes. And if all of this money is being spent and, and nobody's doing any better, then obviously that's a problem. The second expense is called out, it's creating an outcomes-based system. This is something that we have been asking for for years. Um, so what you all should know is that nobody is even tracking how well you are doing. No one's tracking that. Um, uh, your service providers may be required to send a report. Um, you have annual IPPs where maybe they talk about how you're doing, but there's really no consistent way to figure out whether service providers are actually doing their job and regional centers are doing their job. This is um, a $15 million investment to hire a consultant to figure out how to do this, to figure out how to track those outcomes. Um, and, and, and to have data on it, to be able to say, wow, uh, 80, 90% of adults have no employment, but if you use this kind of agency, they are getting people employed and therefore let's give more clients to that agency or create agencies just like that. So we're very excited about this funding. Um, mostly the way that service providers are paid now is just people show up, you confirm the person showed up, it's, it's called compliance, the person showed up and then they get their funding. It's not about outcomes. So we're hoping that they we're gonna create a system where service providers who are doing amazing work are getting paid a whole lot more than service providers who are doing average work. Um, here's where some big money is being spent. So right, so, so you should know that the, um, that the, actual um, technology that is being used at regional centers for their billing systems and their tracking of consumers was developed in 1984. And it's still, for those of you who are old enough, like me to know about computers in 1984, they were using the DOS operating system, which does not exist anymore. And there's this, I don't know if this is really true, but the peop, the only people who know how to use the system are living in retirement homes right now. And they have to be brought out of the retirement home to actually help uh, create the system. So this would be starting from scratch. And what's very exciting to us is that it's gonna have an integrated system so that consumers, us, the people who are served and, are, and the families, We'll be able to have a forward facing system that we will be able to see how money is being spent on us. We'll be able to see the reports of the service providers. If you're in the traditional system, if you're in self determination, you'll be able to see how money is being spent on you and how the billing is going. And this is going to be a forward facing system, kind of like if any of you, what, what Nancy Bargeman calls us, if you, let's say you have Kaiser. Or for me, I go to Cedar Sinai Hospital and my doctors all are on this portal. And I have an app where at any time I can look up my test results, I can look up a doctor's report, I can see when I have an appointment, I can make appointments through that portal. <clears throat> we don't have that in the DD system. That is our goal. Our goal is to be able to just say, you know, oh, I need to go back and look at that IPP from three years ago. You go on the portal, you can find it. You can say, hmm, I wonder if that provider is billing correctly. You can look and see how they're billing. You can see any interaction 
between you and the regional center. All of the emails that you've had back and forth, forth will all be in this system and you'll be able to track it. And um, it'll be it'll be very, very private. We want to make sure that it that the system is not available to anyone at a regional center. You should know, I'll just say that right now, the way the systems work, they're not really private at regional centers. Anybody who works at a regional center can access anybody's um, IPP. And I can tell you for me, I know for a fact that uh, people at my regional center have looked at my son's IPP who have nothing to do with my son's case because it has gotten back to me that somebody said, oh, I was just hearing people in the hallway talk about your son's program. And these are not people who know any who, who know me or knew, who know anything about my son. So we are we want to make sure that they're that the privacy is actually kept intact and secure. And that's one of the things that we hope for as well. Uh, then they're going to spend $20 million training everybody on this, um, training regional centers and DDS. And of course, we have said they should also be training people with disabilities and their family members on how to use these new systems as well. They're also investing $26 million in person-centered planning for up to 15,000 individuals, not up to, but about 15,000 individuals every year who are not in the self-determination program. So that means um, it's going to be, they're going to send out a directive, but what I've heard that they're going to say is it's going to be like people who are aging out of the school system who need a more comprehensive plan, somebody who's maybe moving out of a very restrictive setting, somebody who's been in a work activity program, um, somebody who's uh, you know going through a crisis, health crisis, behavioral crisis, whatever it is that you will be able to access these person-centered planning funds and not use your regional center to do it. So for those of you on this call who are independent facilitators, one of the things that we're pushing for is to ensure that it is that they're not using these sort of vendored agencies who are beholden in some way to regional centers and that these person-centered plans are really gonna help advocate for people to get the kind of services they need. I'm now gonna open up my window because it's gotten very hot in my room. I'm sorry, please. Hold a moment. All right. So now, um, the final piece is um, is uh, supporting the development of new community services. So there, so there are these funds that exist out there called community placement plan funds, CPP funds, and they're going to expand that. Uh, ability for groups to be, for regional centers to think creatively about what are some of the things we'd like to do out in the community? Um, what, you know, how do we want to spend money to create new programs, new service codes to do um, maybe for employment, maybe for college, maybe um, to reduce racial and ethnic disparities. So the final piece is so exciting. So as those of you who've been on our previous STP Connects, you have known that we have been calling for a, um, a, an ombudsperson for the self-determination program. And maybe some of you have never heard that word. I'm not even sure there is a word like that in Spanish. But the ombudsperson is a person who works in the government, who helps people who are served by the government navigate issues, but they also are supposed to be looking at um, sort of systemic issues, problems that exist across the state and, saw, and help to solve those problems and make recommendations to the legislature and to DDS about how to solve those problems. So we were very close and actually we're hoping that the self-determination program ombudsperson will go into the budget next week but then once this is approved, it will be expanded to the entire system, which is something that we've wanted. We didn't want the self, this ombudsperson for just DDS because there's lots of problems with the system. It's not just self-determination. It's a not, and it's not just people in the traditional system. It's just, uh, there's just lots of problems. So there's could be problems with eligibility. There could be problems with specific service providers. So this is gonna create for $20 million, they're gonna start up the, the office um, and then have one and a half million dollars, what's called ongoing each year. We, we think that's not enough, but we think $20 million to start it up is 
is uh, it's kind of high. But there's another piece of this that I want to tell you about. It's not just the ombudsperson office. We um, really, it's not just me, and I, I, I'm going to give a shout out to the Integrated Community Collaborative that I sit on the board of. Um, they are an amazing organization, and the ICC has been advocating, along with many of you, that the fair hearing system, the appeal system at regional centers, is actually unfair. They call it the unfair hearing. And it's because we have to go to these hearings and the regional center gets to hire a lawyer and we don't get to hire a lawyer. We have to come in and represent ourselves unless we're very rich and can afford to pay for the lawyer out of our own pocket. It's really different than in the school system where if you win the case, the school district has to pay for that lawyer. We cannot, that doesn't exist in, in, in the regional centers. We want it to, we've asked for it to. Um, but it's it, it doesn't. So what this um, what this funding is going to look at is how to recreate that system. Maybe the maybe they won't have fair hearings anymore. Maybe they'll stop working. You should know that DDS pays millions of dollars every year to the administrative law judges, the, the called the Office of Administrative Hearings, to have our hearings. And maybe that's a complete waste of money. And we have to figure out a better way to solve disagreements between uh, self-advocates, families, and regional centers. So uh, this is probably the most exciting thing to me. I'm, I have to say that I was very happy about all these issues and then became very exhausted once I realized how much work DBU has ahead of itself. So, um, so we're not going out of business anytime soon here at DDS. Um, so uh, I know there's a million questions, probably Ed. And um, so why why don't I start with Sean with the hand up? And because you've had your hand up for a long time, Sean, uh, but you had your hand up before I explained this. So go ahead and ask me your question, Sean. Um, I say I allowed you to unmute yourself. Oh, hi. Uh, just to let you know that uh, um, uh, Supervisor uh, David Halbert has uh, appointed me the late Levion to uh, do this uh, group and uh, to be the uh, 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 the, the disabled. Uh, um a person to 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 help with any uh, programs that you need and uh, uh, he is uh, uh him and i uh, ran against each other for for mayor of dublin a lot and so uh, i'm a very well-known person um um also uh um uh, i have a question about um um that we were a uh, promise <laughs> by the governor that we were going to get another $600 stimulus. Mm -hmm. But uh, I don't know if it is only because if you do your taxes in 2021 or not, or not. Uh, and uh, so I, um, I'm, I'm waiting on that and because uh, I need it really badly. But um, um, there is a there's a lot of things that you touched on that I could really really you know say hey I know about this I know about that and 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 now I forgot what you brought up and everything but um I, I I'm here to do uh, support you as much as I can. Thank you, Sean. I always love when you come on our meetings and we will we really appreciate you um, helping out. You're, you're a leader in your community. Um, the next is, oh, Carla uh, had a different question. If, um, let me get to some of the questions that's in the chat, Ed. So go ahead and ask those. Oh, I'm sorry, Judy. I didn't realize I was muted. I have buku questions my first i want to get this um done right away because i've never seen this before this question um is from aldrin i think this is a great question can my husband be my independent facilitator and get paid if he is not getting paid from my hss 
Wait, say that again. I'm sorry. Sure. This, this is a question from Aldrin who asks, mm -hmm. can my husband be my independent facilitator and get paid if he is not getting paid from IHSS? No, he cannot. He absolutely cannot, unfortunately. That is a federal government requirement. So um, uh, the husband of an adult self consumer can, and the parent of a child 18 years and under cannot be paid to provide any services for that individual, including independent facilitation. That if you look at the um, directive that was issued by DDS on that issue, they're, they're very explicit on that. I'm sorry, but that's, a, that's an issue related to the federal government. Thank you, Judy. Um, they, so here, let me be clear. They can be an independent facilitator. They just can't be paid for it. It's all about the money, guys, okay? okay. Um, and I know that somebody's writing something in the chat saying that that, but that's actually not the case. The husband cannot be a paid independent facilitator. It's, it's not, the directive is very specific. Okay, go ahead to the next one. Sure, I have a question from Beth. Uh, the regional center of Orange County will not give my independent facilitator a budget so that we can work on getting into the SDP program. They say they're waiting for the budget to be finalized. Is there anything that can be done to push yeah, them yeah. into compliance? So this came up I, at our local advisory committee meeting at Westside Regional Center yesterday. And the excuse that our executive director uh, used was just not true. Um, there's nothing in the state budget that's going to change. There's nothing that's been proposed by DDS or the legislature in the state budget that's going to change how budgets are calculated. There's just nothing. One of the things that they've added is this term called cost effective. But right now, um, it is a, uh, right now the budget is developed based on the traditional system where cost where you have to be cost effective anyway. You have to use the, the average rate. You can't use the most expensive rate unless you have a, a, what's called a health and safety waiver or some other exception. So, um, so to me, um, and I know there are regional centers who are having budget meetings, your regional centers are dragging their feet. They, it's like, this is why we come together, everybody. Even though there are some amazing regional center staff who come on this meeting and um, Adrian, you're one of them. Thank you for always being one of those folks from Lancherman Regional Center. But there's some great people at regional centers, but there are also some people at regional centers who either don't know or are trying to put up barriers. Remember, the, the, this is something that is new. It is a what's called a paradigm shift where they're changing the way they're thinking, where we're in charge of our lives. They're not in charge of telling us what we do every day and who we can spend our days with. This is hard. This is really hard for them. They have had years, by the way, to get used to this. The law passed in 2013. So it is, um, it is, a, uh, it is very frustrating to me that there are still lots of barriers. For those of you, by the way, who are South Central Regional Center clients, at six o'clock, there is the local advisory committee meeting today. I will be going straight from this meeting to that meeting. Encourage all of you, go on their website to, to come to that meeting because that is one of the regional centers that is facing massive barriers um, by staff to get people in. And so uh, any support that you could provide would be incredible. So, um, so it is... So there, all you can do is say other regional centers are doing it. So don't tell me that you can't make it happen. Adrian's getting lots of love in the chat, by the way. Hope, hoping you're looking at that, Adrian. Thank you, Judy. Um, I have an anonymous question. My person-centered facilitator is out of state. My regional center is saying I need to complete a tax form in order to get my reimbursement. I don't understand why we are being taxed on this. Okay, I, I don't understand that either. Um, the the um, the the person that are planner and the independent facilitator will be taxed on the payments that they receive because it's considered income for them, and so they will need to submit their their tax 
form, it's called a W-9, and with their social security number or their employer identification number, but it should have nothing to do with the consumer or the self-determination plan. It's, it's, that should be between the regional center and your person center planner. So I'm very confused by that. Thank you for that. Uh, so uh, it's a W that a, 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 an independent facilitator has to submit a W-2 to get paid. Even if that may be the way they do it, it in most cases it's, it's a W-9 because the person is 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 getting is going to get a 1099. They're not an employee. A W-2 is just for employees. So they're certainly not going to be an employee of the regional center. So that's very odd. Really, you're... you're Financial management services should be able to clarify that. Um, I paid the person. I am asking for my money to be reimbursed. Oh, well, I, uh, I don't know. I may, if somebody wants to put in a, a private uh, message or put something in the chat, if you know and you can answer, I, I don't know about reimbursements from regional centers. I'm not sure how that works at all, but it's certainly a W-2 would make no sense because you're that's only for employees. So I don't, I don't know, it, so I'm not sure. Thank you, Judy. Um, I have infinite other questions if, if you're prepared to take them. Um, yeah, I, I, yes, let's just do that, guys, because we only have 30 minutes more, so I feel bad. Okay, Go ahead. so I have a question from Carla Lehman. If an SD participant is taking a recreational class, like soccer, swimming, or karate, uh, and they need to purchase a specific uniform, like special soccer shoes, karate, or soccer uniform, etc., mm -hmm. could the participant use their budget to purchase these? I know you cannot purchase clothes, but in this case, if it is to participate in a recreational activity, is it possible? I am asking because the RC approved it and then the FMS came back saying it wasn't possible. Yeah, so that, so I don't know whether it's possible. That That is not, that's a new question for me. I'm not sure because the clothing is, is restricted, but uniforms are not. So let's say you're getting a job and you need a uniform. Let's say you're going to be working in a hospital and you need some scrubs. That would be purchasable, but um, I don't know about like a uniform for a recreational program, but it's, but it, what's very odd to me is that if the regional center approved it, then why would the FMS be turning it away? So, I, Carla, I'm, you're unmuted. So, I mean, have you reached out to the FMS to ask what's going on with that? Yes, I did. They never answered to me, but that was yesterday. But I was asking because specifically, for example, like for karate, you need to buy a specific uniform and sometimes they're pricey or like you do horseback riding, you need, you need specific boots or mm -hmm. um, what happens if the participant cannot afford that, but you know, they really want to take that type of class. You, you still need it. So that was my question. Mm -hmm. And the original center approved it. And I don't know why the FMS came back and said no and so yeah so i would i would start with the fms because maybe there was some confusion and it's a simple answer and then if they say no 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 we're afraid we're because because you guys should know that fms's have been getting screwed over by a uh, regional centers where they've been putting out money and, and paying for things and then the regional centers come back and say oh yeah we've changed our mind you we're not going to pay you so, because um, remember, FMSs get paid in what's called arrears. They get paid after they spend the money. So they're put. It's very risky for these FMSs to put out money that they think they're not going to get paid back for. So, and and this it's been happening to them for the last couple of years. So now they're like very nervous about paying certain things. So I would start with the FMS, make sure they understand it was approved by the regional center, and then know that. Um, they are gonna um th then if they say no that we don't the regional center is claiming this that they're not going to pay for it then i'd go back to the regional center and say what what's the deal here so hopefully this will be able to get resolved very quickly yes may i ask something else it's a different sure. question sure so i have clients that have for example aba therapy or floor time therapy or different type of therapies 
And, but they use their budget instead of using an ABA agency, they use someone that is trained, maybe mm -hmm. it's not like a BCBA or mm -hmm. so, but now the regional center are coming back and saying, we need a report. We need a report from the ABA agency to see if you will continue with the services. So what do, what do we do? Where you get a report? <laughs> So that's why yeah. oh, that, I see. Oh, so they need a report to say whether this meet whether that needs to continue to be in the spending in, in the budget. Yeah. So it's not yeah. that they're asking for a report. Mm. They may have a case, Carla. Uh, they may have a case. Do do that? Be because if you're not gonna use that agency, I mean that happens right. also. This when is why, guys. Yeah. I'm telling you guys to never call anything behavior. Like it's all how you put it on your spending plan. Yeah, but but the problem oh. is that they are paying for these 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 service because the, per yes. the person doesn't qualify for medical to get it in medical. So they the original uh -huh. center is paying the traditional system for ABA or floor time. So now to be able to keep that money into the budget, they're asking for a report. But if they're not using that agency, so then, that they did their initial right. reporting, what do you do? Because agencies are not gonna be just doing reporting and then know they're not gonna use their service. Right, so, and, and lots of people are spending their behavior money on things like swimming and horseback riding and karate. So obviously they're not gonna write reports related to behavior. So what I would say, I mean, there, I think the, re the regional centers are reasonable to say, to ask the question, does this individual still require that level of service? I think that's a reasonable question for them to ask folks. And so it is then, then up to them to do a behavioral assessment on that child. So, or that adult. Okay. So, so if, so you should just say, yeah, uh, you know, they're not going to write a report. That's, they're not doing behavioral therapy, but if you want to see if that level of hours and therefore that level of need still exists, go at it. Bring, bring in a behavioral agency to do a behavioral assessment. And if they were providing services, they would say X amount of hours is needed. Okay. The problem so that, with these assessments is that sometimes they're vendors and sometimes they're manipulated. And it happened to me. Totally. Can we, Can we trust them? Right. Yeah. Can we trust yeah. them? Not sure. <laughs> I, I do have to say that I remember when my son was young and, and the school district was making a claim that he didn't need behavioral therapy anymore, which is crazy. Um, but the teacher said that he did, the behavioral agency they, that he worked with him in the school district said he did. Everybody said he did, the occupational therapist, the speech therapist, but the school district was claiming he didn't. And so they brought in an external behavioral agency that we were like really worried about. And they came back with doubling the amount of hours he had. So you just, you just don't know. You just don't know. So um, they could, sometimes they can hire an agency that completely kind of backfires on them. So, yeah. um, okay, next one, Ed. Thanks, Carla. Certainly. I have from Elizabeth Cuevas. My RC is saying they are no longer providing COVID hours. Will ARPA help, uh, I, that may be ARCA, I'm not sure, help restore those COVID hours due to necessity? Yeah, our, it's, so, so it's not ARPA, it's the ARPA meaning the American Rescue Plan Act, it is actually the budget. So the state budget has a line item in it that um, specifically talks about uh, COVID funding, it's like 200 and something million dollars. It's a hell of a lot of money. And the, that budget is, um, is available for, uh, for lots of things related to COVID, but it also is for specific services. But you all really need to remember that you have to make the case for these services. It's not like you can just say, ah, oh, we have, uh, you know, it's COVID, we get 30 hours. That's not the way it works. You have to make the case that you or your child need that extra support because of COVID. So how do you make that case? Um, and you should only make that case if you need it, folks. Uh, we, we have responsibility here to the system. These are taxpayer dollars. So let's say um, your child's uh, behavior regressed. They stopped sleeping like my son, 
who is sleeping now, by the way. I remember I said that a couple of weeks, sleeping again. So yay. Um, who stopped sleeping or who maybe is um, having some, you know, major, really, really challenging issues and very highly dysregulated because the world is opening back up. Maybe they're having mental health issues. Maybe they're depressed. Maybe they're anxious. I mean, all of these things are legitimate expenses under COVID in that they require additional supports that you as a parent cannot be providing that level of help. Another COVID thing is maybe you're having to work extra hours. So you need more respite because you're out of the home more. Maybe um, you're suffering as a parent from mental health issues because of COVID. Maybe you were sick and you have uh, with COVID and you have ongoing um, long haul symptoms. There are so many things related to COVID that you could say, um, and, but it has to be related to COVID everybody. This is not a, it's not like you can just say, oh, by the way, it cannot be educationally focused. You can't say that my son or daughter is very behind in school because of distance learning. That is not the regional center's responsibility. That is the school district's responsibility. And you should be fighting for those home hours of tutoring or after school hours or whatever to get your child back up to speed um, um, and not regress academically. But so outside of school, or if you're an adult, any kinds of regression, mental health issues, um, health, oh, general health issues that are related to the pandemic. Let's say you lost your job. You're an adult and you lost your job because of COVID. You're going to need some extra help to find a new job. That's extra COVID funding. So, so that's sort of the way you ask for it, everybody. That's the way you make your case. Um, next, go ahead, Ed. You are muted, Ed. Oh, thank there you, you are. Me. <laughs> um, the next question I have from Dr. Henny is, are the IHSS, wow, excuse me, are the IHSS trainings approved by us the experts on what meets our needs, referring to the IHSS trainings proposed in the budget. Oh, I wish. I doubt it. I have a feeling that it's going to be SEIU, who's the union for the IHSS workers, of which I am a member and I cannot seem to quit. They, they're for some reason you can't leave the union ever, um, and and thirty dollars out of every paycheck is going to the union. <laughs> so anyway. Um, yay unions, but it is, um, it, it, I have a feeling it'll be sort of the unions come up with the training and cooperation with the Department of Social Services who's in charge of the IHSS program. Um, I am going to, th there is an IHSS sort of stakeholders group and, um, you know, I am sure that they're going to have sort of feedback on what a training should look like. Um, so, I highly recommend you um, you look into, you know, follow it. This is all going to be happening this summer. So if you think you're getting a vacation this summer, like I did, and you're involved in advocacy, you ain't got a vacation anymore. Go ahead, Ed. Awesome. Thank you, Judy. Um, I have a question from Sonny. When they refer to DSPs in the budget, is this limited to DSPs employed at vendors agencies? or would it include those directly hired by SDP participants? Yeah, so what we're trying to ensure is that it would also include the DSPs or the direct support professionals at, for self-determination. So any increase in salary, that would also go. So let's say you have a train, it, it requires some training. I would certainly be sending my son's staff to go through that training. Then the budget would be increased by um, $3 per hour for every hour they work. And then I would be giving them that salary increase. So um, there's also the bilingual um, salary increase. There's the ASL salary increase. So um, from what we are hearing, yes, it would also relate to self-determination. And all of those salary increases would require trainings, correct? Uh, so no, some of them are training and some of them are proving that you're bilingual. Got it. Um, and some of them are proving that you you uh, are, are fluent in, in American Sign Language. Okay. 
Uh, I have a couple of questions pursuant to the training for IHSS that I'm going to sort of um, combine. Okay. So I have one question, what is the specialized training for IHSS again? And I have the question, who should we contact? And I, we may not know, who should, who should we contact if we are either a participant or a parent, or if we are a professional who wants that training? Do we know, or is it wait and see? It is definitely wait and see. Um, it, it, so remember that this plan is just a plan. Um, I believe next week, uh, Secretary of Health and Human Services, Dr. Galley, is sending this plan to the federal government. I well, it's actually due, I think the 22nd. I can't remember the exact date it's due, but it um it is they're gonna be sending it in very oh, the 12th, sorry. So it's due in three days. So they're sending it in three days. And um then uh, it takes 30 days for the federal government to respond. So now we're looking at mid-July and then starts the details, that, that trailer billing, which I was telling you. So it starts this negotiation between the legislature and the, uh, the Secretary of Health and Human Services, as well as the Department of Developmental Services to figure out exactly how that money is going to be spent. Okay. That's going to take several months, potentially even into the fall. No, no, that's not true. It has to be done by September 15th. So that's going to be all summer. Yay. And then, um, then of course, the implementation will start happening. Who the heck knows? Who the heck knows? Um, so, yeah, this is going to be a long year, but a good year. At least we're not fighting budget cuts. Definitely. Definitely. Um, I have a question from Tanya Delgado. Um, I hope, Johnny and Laura, that you heard the answer to that last question because I kind of tried to combine both of yours. Um, Tanya asks, the help for rent for an IDD individual, is it only for LA County? I'm not no. sure. Okay. It's. I was just, I'm sorry, I was using LA County as an example. It's for the whole state, it's for the whole okay. state. Thank you. Um, I have a question from Hawk. Uh, Lanterman is currently working on certifying my budget. If the SLS rate increases, will it automatically change my budget, even if my budget has already been certified? It will not automatically change their budget, although it should, shouldn't it? Because not every participant goes on the STP Connect. For the 98 people who are on this call, you'll know to go back to your service coordinator to say, ooh, I just heard that on June 15th, they approved an increase in rates. You need to increase my budget. Oh, that's so not going to happen, which is why we will try to spread the word through our mailing list, through our SDP Connects, through our, the local advisory committees. But there's so many people who are totally unconnected. So I... You know what? That's an excellent point, and we should we should think about making sort of requiring DDS to send something to everyone to say in the self determination program to say that these that your budget may be increased. Now, here's the thing, guys. When I say your budget may be increased, it's only if your budget needs to be increased. You may have a budget that more than meets your needs. There are a lot of people like that. I can tell you that my son's budget currently meets his needs. And if the rates are increased, I'm not sure I'll be requesting it actually, because right now he's okay. Maybe something will happen in a few months where we'll need an increase and we'll just go back and ask for that. So for those of you who have what you need, please don't go back and ask for more. Our program is costing way more than it should be. Virtually everybody's getting an increase in their budget. And budgets are 20% higher than they were in the traditional system. So if you don't need that increase and you're doing okay, then don't worry about it. But for those of you, and maybe that's why they're not automatically going to do it now that I think about it. But for those of you with very small budgets, and this is going to be very, very helpful to you, then please, that's why you need to hear about us, or hear about this issue. Thank you, Judy. Um, I have... Again, more questions from the list. Dr. Henny asks, I have had many fair hearing outcomes in my favor um, because the regional center learned that I am a great candidate for self-determination. Mm -hmm. They have systematically failed to authorize vendors. 
They've claimed they had no vendors for the services they agreed to in mediation. The panic is that they will claim for my budget uh, mm -hmm. that they have that they haven't spent anything in 12 months. Uh, I need to know that I will have support averaging all their agreed upon services, even if they never put providers in my life. Yeah. So, Hanny, you got to make sure that, and I'm looking at you because you're on my screen, that you got to make sure that you have a really good independent facilitator who's a great advocate for you at your IPP, because you can't do this by yourself. Um, I, you know, I, I feel like I can be a pretty good advocate for my son because I actually know the law better than the people at my regional center. But most of you really could, it would be very helpful for you to bring somebody. Um, one of our board members tells a great story. She's a lawyer at Disability Rights California, and she knows as much about self-determination as I do. But when she, she has a brother who's served by a regional center, and when she goes to his IPP, she just wants to be his brother. She doesn't want to be emotional. She doesn't want to have to fight for anything. And so to have her independent facilitator there, her, her brother's independent facilitator, is such a relief so that they can keep things on track and they can keep asking for what, what his needs are. And so, you know, I, I, I think it's really important, Henny, when you're walking in, you have a very small budget. You are one of many people that I know who have a very small budget and, and you need to have somebody in there. So it's two of you really fighting to make sure you get what you need. Okay. Thank you, Judy. I have a question from Diane. Oh, wait, she, wait, just Henny ha, a, oh. sent me a message that so she doesn't oh. even know where to start to find somebody. Okay. Amazingly, we have some incredible folks. Henny, can you just type in the chat where, what area you live in? Cause I'm not sure what your regional center is. Cause you want to make sure you have somebody local. Um, so there are some incredible independent facilitators who come every week. She's San Diego, everybody. Um, obviously, you can be anywhere, but in my opinion, Henny, you should have someone at least in the Southern California area who knows the services and resources that exist in your um, in your uh, in the, maybe somebody from Orange County or whatever. So for those of you who are independent facilitators, please put your name and your email address in the chat. I see a Johnny Watanabe is say, also saying that he needs an IF in Orange County. So go for it, everybody. Put your contact information in the chat. And there are two potential clients that you have in the San Diego, um, Orange County area. Fabulous. Thank you, Judy. Um, Diane asks, any advice about the use of the word supplies in spending plans? Um, I'm trying to figure out. So no one should use supply. Remember, everything that's in your spending plan has to relate to a goal. So that goal starts in your person-centered plan, which informs your IPP. Connie, if you're on, I said it right this time. So let's say in your IPP, and sorry, in your person center planning, you're talking about employment and you're dreaming about employment, um, but, uh, but you, uh, and maybe your dream is to become a gardener and that, cause you really love gardening. So it, that is your person center planning. And then in your IPP, the goal would be you know, access employment, uh, uh, you know, over the next year or, or do an internship over the next year or a paid internship or something. Um, and so that means that the supplies you might need to become, to, to become a gardener, let's say you hire a local gardening company to be your, you know, mentor or something, right? So you will also need gardening supplies. So don't use the word supplies, use the word we're buying equipment for employment. Um, everything should relate to that IPP goal that you ultimately put in there, which is informed by your person-centered plan. Remember that your person-centered plan is about all your hopes and dreams, some of which costs money, some of which is free, and some of which cannot be paid for out of your self-determination budget. So you want that person-centered plan with everything in your life to inform the goals that are put into your IPP, which are specific to the kinds of things that regional centers are allowed to pay for. Regional centers and the state of California and the federal government. 
There's lots of rules, but there's still so many options. Awesome. I, I, I see that Sandra has her hand up. I'm just going to go to her real quick, Ed. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, Sandra. Sorry, I, my son's doing a dance performance in the, and I have to leave the room and he won't be able to hear me. <laughs> okay, so, um, okay, is it legal for them to not provide a budget? I, Regional Center of Orange County, I told them to send me a notice of action. They are not providing me a budget for my son. He's not in self-determination lottery, yeah. but July 1st, mm -hmm. I know it's not signed, but they're saying, you know, they haven't received any direction from DDS, so they're not doing any budgets until July. Okay. And I, from what you just said earlier, it doesn't sound like there's going to be direction from DDS in no. July either. No, there's not. So this is why I don't understand this exact thing is happening at Westside Regional Center where they're not having budget discussions with, with, so it it's just makes my head want to explode. It's just more ways that regional centers want to control us. No, you have a right to have a budget meeting. You don't have a right to move into the self-determination program until July 1st. Exactly. But it's you have a right I, to I have a budget to meeting. Me, I just told them to send me a, an NOA. I'm yeah. going to fair hearing for a freaking budget. Yeah. And, but you know and, that you will. And we're, we have no unmet needs. It's yeah. a simple, it's a yeah. simple budget. So what I tell people, what you know, and you don't need this, but what I tell and Carla people, says, what do we do? Because she's yeah. got, I've got four. Other I mean, clients. honestly, I would, if, all of you who want to get in, every single one of you should be filing what's called 4731 complaints, that your civil rights are got being it. violated. If I could ask Nina, I'm making you do so much work today, Nina. If I could ask you to just look quickly on the DDS website and provide the link of how people can file a 4731 complaint. Very easy. Lots of you I'm looking at have filed them on various issues in the past. DDS is required to respond to those 4731 complaints. If like 50 of you do it today, oh, oh Ed already found it. Wow, she's so ahead of you, Nina. She's so um, fast. If 50 of you actually file them today, oh my, that's gonna get noticed by DDS. Another thing that I don't want to forget to say in our last three minutes is that each of your regional centers have a statewide, uh, sorry, have a local advisory committee. You yeah, they don't advise. You should be showing up to your local advisory committee meetings and the stuff you say to me on these calls should be said to the advisory committees. Their job is to provide oversight of the regional center. And if they're not hearing from you, then they won't know. And um, in fact, there's one in two minutes at South Central Regional Center. So for those of you who are interested in that, please go to that meeting. Um, we had one last night at Westside Regional Center, and we spend a lot of our time think, asking people how they're doing. Um, so, you're, so you need to get your voice out there. That's the only way things are going to change. You are in charge. You are empowered. We really, this is a very exciting future that we have. Okay. Uh, do we have time for any more? So I, I have time for one more minute. Okay. So real quick from Hawk, with the ARCA funding, how does one access the direct care bonuses? And will that include self-determination care positions such as a running buddy, which will be some reimagined SLS hours for mm -hmm. someone who can take my son to these activities and actually participate and keep up with him? Mm -hmm. Uh, yes. Uh, uh, so the same thing I said, this is going to be over the next few months that they're going to be figuring this stuff out. And then it's going to take a few months more to develop the training programs. We're going to be pushing, pushing, pushing for them to do it quickly because if it, you know, they have the money now. And if we can't increase the salaries for another year, then what good is it? So um, but yeah, stay tuned, guys. I'll keep you updated at these at these STB connects. So I want to thank everybody. Um, please, please file these. Someone's saying file the forty seven thirty one complaints. If fifty of you do it today, I swear we'll get the attention of the of DDS on this. 
Um, and um, we will be back next week again for another episode of SDP Connect. This is not nearly as fun as watching TV. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm going to go watch Handmaid's Tale tonight. That's way better. It's Wednesday night. The next episode's in. Um, so thank you, everybody. And we look forward to seeing you um, next week. Take care. Bye, all.